Inter Miami tried to pull off some more late dramatics on Wednesday, but this time the team's comeback efforts fell just short. Hello everybody, welcome back to the second of two episodes of Miami Total Football Radio, your number one and most loved podcast on Inter Miami, providing you all the latest news, updates, analysis, inside information, general punditry, and much, much more. We also go by the name of Miami Total Football Radio. My name is Franco Panizo. I am one of your regular co-hosts. We have only one other co-host on this second edition of the pod this week, and that is Steve and Primo Brenner. Steve, we're doing it like the old days. No Jose, no Andrea, just you and I ready to debate some good Inter-Miami soccer slash football. So, how are you doing the day after Inter-Miami's most recent game, a 2-1 loss to the Philadelphia Union? Yeah, pre-Jose feels like sort of pre-pandemic <laughs> or something like that. Sort of, those, those days when he wasn't around, that sort of that negativity that follows him sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. No, we're going old school, that's, that's fine. And unfortunately... Uh, into Miami went pretty old school, didn't they, with their performance the other night? And that was a yeah, de- pretty desperate, desperate performance. I was there with you, uh, watching on from the press box, and uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, wasn't pretty, was it really? So uh, yeah, wasn't uh, a, a wake up call potentially, I guess, for them. But uh, wasn't good viewing from the press box, was it? No, not much fun. You definitely you talk about negativity for hosted last night. I think it was the most negative I've heard you be about Inter Miami well, in, in a look- in a long long time. Hey, I'm not I'm not saying there's something anything wrong no, with that. It's just there normally wrong with it. normally you're the you're the more optimistic, more. I just positive. thought they just I just thought they were just really poor last night. I just really bad. <laughs> they didn't play well at all, did I, they? They didn't, no. They I, didn't. It was really bad. You know how professional sports teams have uh, those like those segments that they put on social media or on TV where, where they mic up a player or a coach and you hear bits and pieces of their day at training? I wish we could have mic'd you up and shared with the listeners your comments from the press wow. box yesterday. Be like, hey, look, I think it was it, it was the most critical you've been, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Listen, being critical, dude, I, I've been probably, I have been the most critical person from day one on this pod till now. So I'm not I'm not criticizing you for being critical. It was just different. It was different well, from what, what we normally get from it. I'm normally positive, but last night I just thought, yeah, I just couldn't hold on to the ball, could they? Kept giving the ball away, and that's always frustrating to watch. And I think we even pointed out they had most of the possession as well, but yet just didn't do anything with it. Yeah, it's well, the same old story. Well, we will hear El Primo's more critical remarks on this edition of Miami Total Football Radio. Because we're going to, of course, dive into that 2-1 to one defeat to the Philadelphia Union. We're also going to touch on this upcoming weekend's game against Charlotte FC. A game that's important for Inter-Miami because they're still within reach of a playoff spot. But the schedule isn't going to get much easier for them. So we'll touch on those two games. Of course, we're going to touch on Gonzalo Higuain. The overall attack, which has been ailing quite a bit. Very anemic. Still struggling in that regard. We'll talk about Emerson Rodriguez. We'll talk about whether the penalty kick that was awarded to the Philadelphia Union was actually a penalty kick or not. And we'll talk about Phil Neville. And just like the old days, when we used to talk about Phil Neville and uh, we used to debate about it. And I told you last night we would talk about him on, on this pod. You said what? Whether he's on the hot seat? No, that's not what we're going to talk about here. But I do have a question for you about Phil Neville that I think is interesting and I'm curious to hear your remarks because we haven't spoken about what exactly I'm going to ask you. So we've got a lot to get into. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get to it. Okay, so Inter Miami, as we mentioned before, suffers a midweek 2-1 to defeat to the Philadelphia Union at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale. And the goals came from... Daniel Gazdag in the 26th minute off a penalty kick. Corey Burke doubles Philadelphia's lead 40 minutes later in the 66th with a header over Damian Lowe past Drake Callender. Gonzalo Higuain off the bench scores his first goal since April. What a goal. A A sensational golazo from distance. Turned back the clock. Looked like the Gonzalo Higuain of... Maybe his prime, just because of how he finished it. Well, again, we'll dive into that in just a bit. 
Inter Miami has some life late on. They even get six six minutes of stoppage time, but they're not able to find that equalizer. So they fall two to one at home. First defeat at DraftKings Stadium since April. And there's plenty to dive into, and we will dive into, but we'll start with your overall thoughts. I know you just gave us a quick rundown, a quick synopsis of your overall thoughts on the game, but just dive into it a little bit more, round out the thought, your analysis on this game on Wednesday night. Yeah, well, they did. I just, you know, they did have a lot of possession. I think 62% of possession at the end of the game, but they just kept giving the ball away every time they went forward. In midfield, Motta, Gregore, in particular, I remember a few times losing the ball. They just kept losing it. I think we asked, we spoke to DeAndre Yedlin afterwards, and you know, we sort of said that was one of the problems, wasn't it? He said, "Yeah, you know, we just um, we just weren't good enough on 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 the ball, and that was a that was a collective created nothing." And at the back, Damian Lowe and uh, Mabika had a sort of night to forget. Mabika was taken off at half time, wasn't he? But um, Damian Lowe was a bit shaky as well, so wasn't wasn't good. And f- I think Philadelphia just used the ball much better when they had it, didn't they? They just attacked much more concisely. Uh, Campania was very, very quiet, barely touched it, didn't he? Iguain came on, didn't look as sharp, looked like he um, probably hasn't trained for a week or so, I would, I would have thought. But then, you know, it's a great goal. He's just got a bit of presence, hasn't he? And that was a great goal, but they didn't deserve anything out of it, really. It was, it was pretty disappointing, just because they couldn't make any inroads into a Philadelphia defence that defended really well. And they've, they've been a good, they're in good form, aren't they? So, and they were a good team, and it showed. They have, they're in first place now in the Eastern Conference. And by the way, Julian Carranza, his loan, since we spoke on the last pod, his loan option has become a permanent transfer. It was made a permanent transfer before this game against Inter Miami. So he was eligible to play because he's now no longer on the books of Inter Miami. He is a Philadelphia Union player. He did not start. He came off the bench in this one. He looked a bit hungry for the goal, but did not, did not get one or did not get an assist either so uh a, a rather uneventful return for him at drive pink stadium but look overall it's much of the same story and it's we've been banging the drum over and over and over again in terms of the attack and the attack struggled again in this one and it just was not that dangerous was not that lethal they put three shots <clears throat> on target three shots despite having more possession and one of those shots was that long-range golazo from Gonzalo Higuain. So if you take that away, they had two shots on target from the run of play, despite having more possession, and obviously that's not that's not good enough. And we can talk about why that is. We will talk about why that is, because we're past the halfway point in the season. There are reinforcements on the way, but it was it, it's, it's the same story. It's the same old story. A team can't score. The team struggles to score. The team... The team looks okay in the middle third at times. It looks okay in the defensive third at times, but it's in the attacking third where the real problems lie, at least my, my opinion. I mean, I think the numbers back that up. You look at their, their goal-scoring output for the year. It's no secret that they've gone out to try to get Pozuelo, and it's no secret why they've gone out to go get Pozuelo, Alejandro Pozuelo, as well as uh, our, our good friend Coco that Steve Brenner announces uh, or pronounces his name exquisitely. But... Jean. <laughs> uh, but yes but it, it, it's just more it's more of the same it's more of the same and at this point they need those reinforcements as soon as possible I think there needs to be a little bit more uh, there needs to be better attacking ideas and I think that comes from the coaching staff but again we'll dive into that in just a bit by the way this was the formation Inter Miami came out with it was a 4 3 3 you could maybe look at it as a 4-2-3-1, but I would say a 4-3-3 based on, on what we saw. And that was Drake Callender in goal. The back line from right to left, DeAndre Yedlin, Damian Lowe, Amema Bika, Christopher McVeigh. The midfield was Gregory and Jean Mota with Bryce Duke ahead of them. And then the front three were Robert Taylor, Leonardo Campana, and Emerson Rodriguez. So we're gonna we're going to dive into specific players, specific elements, specific components of the team and of the game. But let's start with just the attack. What do you attribute, not only Wednesday night, let's go a little bit bigger picture here, the overall struggles that the attack has had this year? Is it players? Is it coaching? Is it no DPs? Is it a little bit of everything? What do you attribute Inter Miami's 
goal scoring issues too because right now they have scored 19 goals in 19 games obviously that averages out to one per game that is fewest fewest in the eastern conference i'm checking to see if that's fewest in the league it is fewest in the league yes tied with sporting kansas city which is in last place in the western conference so sporting kansas city's played more games though but anyway they're tied for last as of right now in terms of goal scored Primo, why do you think Inter Miami continues to have goal scoring problems? Well, I think because that the, the, that front three you mentioned of Taylor, Campagna, and Rodriguez, that they, they were they just weren't in the game at all last night, were they? Really, I don't think Taylor kept getting the ball and kept giving it away. Campagna was kind of starved for service, barely touched it, and Rodriguez just was kept running running well, but just not you know just didn't really produce anything. You know, it's a quite tired you know, performance really. They just look kind of really out of ideas early on. You know, there's been a lot of games recently, I guess. Maybe that's a bit of fatigue in there. But, um, you know, because Taylor's usually a little bit more lively, you know, from the times I've seen him play. Um, but, yeah, it's just those three didn't play well. And Bryce Duke was pretty quiet, wasn't he? And Grigore and, and Motta buzzed around, but they also kept giving the ball away as well. So um, no, no one in the midfield or attack had a good day. And I think that's, you know, you could tell that that was the reason why they... They lost that game because they just didn't create any chances. I don't remember anything really of note too much before Iguain's goal, was it? But give me give me bigger picture. Why is this team struggling in the attack? Because yesterday is just an extension of what we've seen throughout the course of this season. So That's... why do you think this team is struggling in the attack in 2022? Well, I guess, yeah, they miss that DP sort of superstar <laughs> that you'd probably want in where Bryce Duke is playing. So you want Pozuelo where Bryce Duke in Bryce Duke's position, and he would be the man to to create. I guess that's the that's the thing. It didn't come off for him last night, did it, Bryce Duke? But you know, he's not a he's not a big money DP player, is he? So Pozuelo is that guy. But that's that's going to be that's going to be the difference, I think. And those, those two can't come soon enough. We asked him Phil Neville about it on on last week, didn't we? So what what did he say? Well, he had given a different timeline than he gave on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, he said Pozuelo is 50-50 for this weekend's game against oh. Charlotte FC. So that's better news because as of you know previously when we spoke to him about it, he, he said that he might not be eligible until the FC Cincinnati game, which is later on in the month. So the fact that he may be able to play this weekend is a big boost for Inter Miami. But let's stay on this game. Let's stay on, on the overall struggles that the team is having. Look, I think there's that's one reason. I don't think it's the only reason. I think there's a lot of reasons that go into why this team is the worst, at, or one of the worst attacking teams in the league right now. And look, they don't have they don't have uh, DPS out there consistently from the start. That's certainly a, a factor. I think another factor is the coaching, and this is where I'm going to ask you the question: Is Phil Neville a defensive-minded head coach in your eyes? Yes or no? No, I don't, I don't think so because the formation we just talked about is, is an attacking formation, isn't it? If if the players could pull it off, you know that's okay. what play, that's 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 what everyone plays right now, isn't it? So, um, so you think he's an attacking okay. juggernaut? Like, I mean, how would you describe Phil Neville's coaching style in the two in the one season and change that he's been here in South Pra Just pragmatic, I think. I think he just deals with what he's what he's got. Okay. Um, I think he's trying to put them into that. In, in, the players need to be better, don't they? They need to be better than they were last night. On paper, that's that is quite a sort of tasty front three. You know, you'd have thought, oh, that they could cause some problems last night. They didn't. Okay, so I would say he's definitely a defensive-minded head coach, or he has been while he's been at Inter Miami. And I think Christopher McVeigh is the prime example that you look at and you see where or why. Phil Neville is a defensive-minded coach, or the player that illustrates that why Phil Neville is a defensive-minded coach. Because Christopher McVeigh continues to get starts at left-back. Is Christopher McVeigh a natural left-back? No. He's a center-back that's being played out there on the left. And he doesn't project forward all that much. He doesn't get into the attack all that much. Again, because he's he's a center-back. bit slower, not, not a natural full-back that gets forward into the attack. So why does Christopher McVeigh start? Well, earlier in the year, you know, there's injuries to Breck Shea, Kieran Gibbs, Noah Allen isn't isn't ready for regular minutes in MLS. 
So Christopher McVay at one point became the default left back. But at other times when Kieran Gibbs has been healthy and Jovan Jones is another option that's, that's, that's on the roster, Phil Neville has continued to go to Christopher McVay. Again, why? Because McVay defensively is serviceable and he, and he can help hold down the fort or that flank. But attacking-wise, he doesn't give you a whole lot. So what is Phil Neville prioritizing by putting Christopher McVeigh at left back? He's not prioritizing the attack. He's prioritizing the defense. And well, what are the other options then? What, what's the other option? I, I mean, I just, I just gave them to you. Jovan Jones is on the roster. He's healthy. He's experienced. Right. He, he might not be great. But there are options. If Phil Neville wanted to be more attack-minded, he has options to do so. But he continues to go to Christopher McVeigh because Christopher McVeigh has, by and large, held up well defensively at left back. But in the attack, he offers very little. And I think in this game, you saw that once again. Because I don't think, and we had a big, big, big debate with Andrea Jose on the last podcast earlier in the week about Emerson Rodriguez. I thought he had a poor game in this one. It was his first start in MLS play, the chance he's been waiting for, and he didn't impress. Now, I think part of that is on him, but I think the other part is on the fact that he didn't have an, uh, a fullback overlapping and helping him to combine and take some pressure off of him. Because every time he got the ball, he was one on two. Not every time. A, a, a lot of times. He was one on two. Instead of being one on one, which is his strength, which is where you would like to see him you know, be better. Because again, I don't think he played well. But he also didn't have help. Inter Miami's most dangerous moments, or when they were most threatening in the attack, came down the right wing. When Robert Taylor and DeAndre Yedlin started combining in that first half, especially, and they started finding each other, playing passes in behind, because now you have now you have the the opposing team's outside midfielder and their 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 fullback one on one against each of you. On the opposite flank, when, when Christopher McVeigh's not pushing into the attack, you have Emerson Rodriguez facing up against that fullback and that midfielder, so that wide midfielder. So Emerson Rodriguez, again, didn't have a good game, even when he was in one-on-one situations or when he had moments that he should have capitalized on, still didn't do a good job, so that's on him. But he also doesn't have much help in terms of a fullback, the marauding fullback that can help him combine, that can help create spaces and passes and... You, he did, he didn't have that. On the right side, you did have that with the other than Taylor. And I know you were critical of Taylor. I don't think it was his best game either. But the more dangerous moments came when, when he and Yedlin combined down that right wing. And then they whipped in crosses. Those crosses were pulled too soon or too late or off the mark often uh, against the Philadelphia Union. And that hurt into Miami. If they had been a little bit sharper there, maybe they're able to, to get a goal. But they weren't. But again, the overall point is that I think Phil Neville is a defensive-minded head coach. And I think the proof is in the pudding. Because right now, Inter-Miami, with a very different team than last year, is tied for last place in goal scored. Last year, with a different team, and yes, it was a, a poorly constructed team. And you know all the, all the things we've criticized last year's team of being. But they had DPs. They had Pizarro, they had Higuain, they had Matuidi. And they finished tied for second worst in terms of goals scored in the entire regular season. So two different teams, two different teams are struggling to score. I think Phil Neville plays a part in that. I think he plays a part in that. I think the 5-0 that they, that he suffered to the New England Revolution last year in summer, and then that's when he made the switch to the five-man back line and things got better, I think that really... Uh, really impacted Phil Neville. And I think that that made him now think, okay, we have to prioritize the defense at all costs to give ourselves the best chance of winning. That's just my opinion. That's just my my, my thoughts from the outside because since then, I, I think we've seen Phil Neville be very, very defensive-minded. You don't agree with that. I mean, I mean, I guess, look, I haven't watched it as intently as you in terms of to, to, for every game. So difficult to say, but I, I guess, yeah, when you put it like that, maybe he has been a bit defensive, but I still think he's just trying to deal with that. They just they just haven't had the players, have they? They just but this is his the... team, right? Isn't this his yeah, team? But... Isn't this his team that he said he's put together? That he he found all the people. Like okay, not him himself, but he and the staff worked very arduously during the off season and spent 
countless hours and, and yeah. they almost got no rest. And this is the team that is his team that he put together. Well, we're still waiting for two more players to come in, aren't we? So, um, you know, there's that argument with it as well. Plus, you know, the, the, the lack of DPs. So that's obviously Pozuelo's coming in. So that's it. So I guess, yeah. So I think, look, I think the, the players that are being brought in, I think they will help. I mean, it, they, they really can't hurt the team in, in terms of the attack because Inter Miami, again, right now tied for fewest goals in, in MLS. They should help. But are they going to make a huge difference? I mean, it's possible in MLS. I've seen it in MLS that one player comes in and, and they make a huge difference. Team goes on a run. Team makes it into the playoffs. So that's it's possible. They need something, don't they? They need, they need that creative spark. But I need to see thing. ideas, Steve. Primo, I need to see attacking ideas. Well, I want to see what we're being told. football from the team. But I, it, it can't just be on one player, primo, primo. No, it can't, it can't no, just no, be but... on Pozuelo to be all right. Now you're all of a sudden you have to pull the strings and you have to create chances and do like. Because guess what? Let's say Pozuelo comes in rusty, or Pozuelo goes down with an injury, or Pozuelo, like collectively, you need to see more from Inter Miami, and I don't see enough from Inter Miami. Last night, again, you were very critical in the press box, and I agreed with you because I don't see collectively that many attacking ideas. I see the same thing over and over. Get down the wing. And whipping across. That's all I see from this team. And that's something that, you know, that might be what they want to do. But they're clearly not that good at it. Because the, the, the numbers don't lie. So, if that's the case, you need to find other ways to unlock a team. You need to find other ways. You If you don't have a number 10, there's still ways to go about it. You can still knock the ball around and, and, and do, you know, one to two touch passing. Quick passing movements. Diagonal runs in behind the defense. You know, in Spanish... Uh, you, you say asociaciones, you don't see that. You don't see like partnerships developing on the field in terms of combination play. You don't see triangulaciones, triangulations, the, the, where three guys are knocking the ball around to, to create space. You don't see that uh, that unbalancing of defense. I don't see that much of an attacking idea. Now, I think to, Motta, to... And, Motta and Gagore have like a good sort of partnership together. I think, I think that's maybe what, something that's come out. You know, Lo and Mabika were both really poor. Um, you know, on on you know, last night, but um, yeah, and the attack. Robert Taylor has been a good player and has put in some good performances, but it just didn't work last night. But um, I don't know. They'll say, wait, wait. We want to have a DP in there to see then. You know, what difference he can make. So he has to do something. They have to have to have something, something to, creative spark to spark them. Otherwise, they're going to they're going to miss out on the playoffs. And look. Again, just to, to round out the point that, that, I, that I'm trying to make here is that, look, I, to Phil Neville's credit, last night I did see the team push more numbers into the attack. I did see that from Inter-Miami. Where in other games I've seen Inter-Miami attack with three players against six or seven, and that's obviously a numerical disadvantage. Let's say you whip in a cross. Unless the cross is perfect to the striker... You're probably not winning that. And if the ball falls to somebody else or or there's a loose ball, just from a number standpoint, you're probably not going to get it because, you know, the opposing team has more players in the box than you do. Yesterday, I saw more numbers forward. I saw more numbers committed forward. So that is, for me, a step in the right direction in terms of what Phil Neville is, is trying to do with the team. But I still don't see enough clear-cut attacking ideas. I just don't see that. And look, Pozuelo, again, he'll help. Quarantan John will help. But only to a certain extent. You still need collectively for the team to play well. Because you, you can't just rely on individualisms or individualistic efforts to get you out of the hole consistently. It's just not going to work. Last night, Gonzalo Higuain, I mean... Credit to Gene Mota, he won the ball high up the field, and then it, it falls to Iguain, and Iguain took care of the rest. But it was an individualistic effort. It was not. It was not. A, it was not from the run of play with good combinations or or, 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 or nice intricate passing sequence. It was Gonzalo Iguain taking the ball, uh, pulling off an exquisite, exquisite cut past his defender, and then unleashing a ferocious left-footed effort into the back of the net. So. Look, again, to reiterate, Pozuelo will help. He's a DP. He can pull the strings. He can score goals himself. But if this team doesn't start showing more collectively, Pozuelo's only going to do so much. And that might not be enough for Inter Miami to make the playoffs. So they yeah. they got to figure they got to figure that they have to figure that out. And if that means being less defensive minded and and taking more risks and leaving yourself exposed at the back. 
then so be it. Because right now, I mean, one this one this 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 style isn't isn't very sexy. And last night, I think it was the probably the worst attended game of the season, from just from the eyeball test. I don't know what the numbers are, you know, the announced attendance or whatnot, but that's always you know exaggerated a bit. So just from the eyeball test, I think it was the the worst attended. And look, Inter Miami, maybe they're like, all right, this is our best chance to make it to the playoffs. It's just to, to you know, try to grind out wins and, and, and you know, sneak it out 1-0 or 2-1, whatever the case is. But it's not working. So at some point, you're going to have to take more chances. And it can't be when there's eight games left and your back is against the wall. Because then you're, you're selling yourself short. You're cutting your chances and your odds of making the playoffs. They need to, they need to start looking for more answers or taking more risks in the attack as soon as this weekend. That's just my opinion. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right, they do. They do. They need to, something needs to change. But let's see what happens when Pozuelo comes in. He's supposed to be the guy that's going to sort all this out. So, um, you know, if the, the, the attack is functioning, then they can. They know they can draw on experiences they've had before in, 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 at the back in defence where they've been they've been fine, you know, and they have other numbers to come in. So, but what if Pozuelo can't? Let's say Pozuelo can't play for three more MLS games. Then that's three yeah, more MLS games that they, they, they don't have. Up, someone else has got to step up. Yeah, so, but it, it's, it can't just be oh the players have to step up. Like the players step up within a function of of, of a team. And it, it's not just oh the players one player has to just do this or one player has to do this and do that. Look, Inter Miami, and here's another here's another, uh, and this is this is necessarily go to the defensive point that I made about Fonola being a defensive minded coach, but. But they don't score off set pieces. And that's something I've banged on the drum since last year and the year before that with Diego Alonso. This team has more height. They have Damian Lowe, Amey Mabika, Ryan Saylor, Christopher McVeigh, uh, Leonardo Campana. You know, when Breck Shea's healthy, he's in there. They have targets. And yet they still can't score regularly off of set pieces in the way that the Philadelphia Union did last night. And that goal for the Philadelphia Union, by the way, proved to, to be the winner. Why is Inter Miami unable to score on set pieces two years in a row, three years, but we're not talking about Diego Alonso, we're talking about Phil Neville and his staff. Two years in a row, they're unable to score off set pieces with two different teams. And they have a set piece specialist on the, on the coaching staff. Like, why is it so difficult for this team to score goals? That, that's the question. I don't think you can put that on just one player. I think when you have the sample size that's this big, You've got to look at the coaching staff and something that the, the, the way that they're working or how they're working, it's not good enough. It needs to be tweaked. It needs to be altered because if you're not scoring from the run of play, if collectively you don't have it, then get us get set, get set pieces. Become a threat on set pieces. Give yourself a chance to to open up a team, and then that team has to has to come at you more. That gives you space on the counter. That that gives you more chances to score because you have more spaces to exploit. There's a lot of shortcomings on this team. Yes, I think player talent is one of them, 100%. But I don't think coaching is absolved of, of any blame. I think they're, they're, the coaching staff, there's things that they could be doing better, my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's worth making the point now then, isn't it, that Martin Patterson, who was like working with Phil Neville's coaching team, has left the club and he's gone to, he's gone to Barnsley in the, uh, in the championship back in the UK. So that was, a, I guess, a blow for the coaching team. You know, and he has it. not been replaced, right? He has not been replaced. I don't think he's going to be replaced. You know, Phil Neville's contract's up. Um, I guess it's, it's it's uncertain right now. So, you know, he can't start recruiting staff saying, yes, yeah, stay with me. We'll have a great time. And, you know, and it could come to an end. You just don't know. So, but they ha- but the, I guess the bottom line is they haven't been able to replace him. Um, so to what happens? Does Jason Christ step up? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that. Maybe we'll have to ask. But, um, yeah, I guess that's that's a blow for any coaching team, isn't it? Not not giving anyone any excuses, but um, they're down a man. Well, Jason Christ has been the number two for for the entire year. Pat Pattinson was was signed back in January from the second team. Now he's left as of this month, which which has flown under the radar here in South Florida. But he he has he did leave, and he has not been replaced. You can read, like you said, into read in between the lines as to what that means for Phil Neville and his staff if he's not able to to bring in a, an assistant or hasn't brought in an assistant yet. What that means for his prospects going into this this off season. But we will we'll switch gears for now because we've talked about the attack a good bit. Let's talk about something that was a good thing from this game, and that's Gonzalo Higuain's finish. Golazo. 
I've already raved about it. You know, just class the way he's able to get by his defender. You know, he gets the defender to bite on on the right footed shot, fakes it, goes on his left, and then he still has the quality from distance from outside the penalty area to hit it past Andre Blake, arguably the best goalkeeper in MLS. So that's the type of quality that Inter Miami has been missing in terms of DPs delivering. Again, this is only Gonzalo Higuain's third goal of the of the year first since April, and the first from the run of play in 2022. So, you know, that that you know that type of contribution would help a bit more, something Phil Neville acknowledged after the game. He said if we can get Gonzalo scoring five, six goals, or seven, I forgot the numbers he, he put out there, but he's like, if he scores more goals from here to the end of the season, we stand a good shot of making of making the playoffs. But what do you think of the goal overall? It was one of very few bright spots for Inter Miami. It was. It was a opinion. great goal, wasn't it? Great, lovely turn, great finish. No, but it, um, yeah, that, that's what that's what he can do. But I didn't think he looked as trim as he has done. He, I don't think he's trained properly for the last sort of week or so. Missed the game on land. I didn't. He said he was ill, and it was like, oh, it's another one of those. Oh, is he ill? No, we're not really sure. We don't know. But um, yeah, uh, he, that's what he can do. He just we don't. He just hasn't been able to do that on a consistent basis, which is really you know, which is which has hurt them. Because if he was able to do that on a consistent basis, and then they had these other players to come in as well, then the team would look different, wouldn't it? But as as right now, it's just a little bit pedestrian because they just don't have that creative spark. And he could have been that, but just hasn't done it consistently. But it's still a great goal. He's, he's still a class player. So I would say, obviously, there's nothing to take away from the goal. Nothing. A heck of a goal. Probably, if not the best one Inter Miami has scored this year, surely up there amongst the best. But again, last on the not not the last pod, but last week's pod, I said I think he's finished. I think he's done physically. He doesn't give you a whole lot. Obviously, this type of goal shuts my mouth a bit. But we need to see it more consistently. And I think I think this goal just was a byproduct of a play that just came out perfectly for him. He, you know, Inter Miami won the ball up high up the field. He he got the ball in open space. He did have to get by one defender, but he was able to do so. And then he was able to use la potencia that he has, the strength and the sheer power that he has from distance to blast that shot into the back of the net. From the run of play in other games, when the game's a little bit more closed, when the other team isn't uh, isn't so open and, they're, they're, you know, they, they have their lines a little bit tighter... You see how he struggles. You see how he struggles. So I think this play that presented itself was the absolute perfect play for the player that Gonzalo Higuain is today, and he took full advantage of it. If he can take full advantage of more plays like that going forward, then then I will eat Crow and say, look, he's not finished, but he needs to find ways to make an impact in, in, in more than just this type of way, or, or at least consistently. If he wants to do it this type of way, fine, but consistently needs to do it. it can, and if it's not in this type of way, then he has to find other ways to make an impact, whether it's assisting or scoring. just has to find other ways because he is a DP. Yes, he's not getting a whole lot of minutes, but he is one of the players that has the most quality on this team. So, I mean, so a player that can, that can create some magic, that can pull a rabbit out of a hat. So... You need that sometimes, when, especially when collectively it's not there on the day. So we'll see how he, how how it goes for him going forward. Do you think this goal does anything to help his case for minutes? I mean, maybe maybe anything's too too drastic, but how much do you think this goal helps his case for more minutes? Given that Pozuelo is on the brink of entering the fold. Yeah, I mean, he didn't. What else did he do other than other than the scoring the goal? He he sort of buzzed around a bit and did a few nice touches, but didn't really. He looked do much. engaged. He looked engaged, but I agree that I don't think he was yeah. like wow, like you know, other no, than the goal. No, he didn't. He did okay when he came on. Yeah, no, he's a he's an impact sub for sure. I don't think that that changes. It just um, you know, and Campania had a very just quiet night, didn't he? he? Bet he was barely in the game at all. Um, don't even remember him going really close at all, did he? Did he have any? He, no, had, no. he had. I'm trying to think. He, I think he had one header that, that. Yeah, he had one header that was contested. It wasn't great. Um, and it, it was harmlessly wide of the frame. I will say this because Phil Neville did say something about in the post game about having. You know, once Pozuelo was in there, what it might look like with Higuain. He said something along those lines about having those two playing off of one another. Higuain playing off of Pozuelo. Campana, there's no denying he's been 
one of, if not the best player for Inter Miami this year. But as of late, I, th- I I'm of the opinion that he's cooled down a little bit. That he's he's slowed down a bit from where he was. And then, you know, that's not just because of the goals. I think it's just the overall his overall play overall. So I th- still think he's the the top option at striker Campana. But if he continues to struggle or not not play to a higher level, I think the door opens for Gonzalo Higuain and Pozuelo to play together, just based off of what Phil Neville said yesterday. Now, I don't know if that experiment will last very long if there's not a uh, high performance level because, because we know that Higuain, from a defensive standpoint, doesn't give you a whole lot physically. In 50-50s, in aerial balls, doesn't give you a whole lot. You know, again, I've, I've said that before. It's why I think he's he's all but retired at this point. But I don't rule out the possibility that he could jump back into the starting lineup somewhat soon once Pozuelo is introduced based off of what Phil Neville said last night. However, again, just to reiterate, I think Campana is still the top strike, striker option on this team. That's the dream, isn't it? You want them both. You want them both firing together, but it just—that's it, not him, though, is it? He's not going to play like that. So, well, yeah, he's not going to play with with Campana and Iguain with Pozuelo. Like, yeah. I just—I don't—I don't see that. Maybe you know, late, late on in a game, if they're searching for a goal, something like that. But starting a game, I don't see it. But you know, Iguain and Pozuelo, possibly, it's possible. Okay, let's go to quickly to the other side because we've talked about Iguain, we've talked about Taylor, we talked about Emerson. Who I don't think capitalized on his opportunity, albeit again, reiterating, did not have much help on that left flank. Let's go to the other side of the field. Penalty kick on Ame Mabika. Something Inter Miami was miffed about post game. Now, they didn't make a big fuss about it, they didn't make a big deal about it, at least not in their post game comments. But you could tell that they were aggravated or frustrated by the call that. I wrote about this actually on Miami Total Football Substack, which, yes, is back. So if you want to read that article, you can for free. It's on Miami Total Football Substack at miamitotalfootball.substack.com. But head referee Marcos de Oliveira points to the spot after Ame Mabika's outstretched leg at the corner of the 18-yard box brings down Mikael Urre. And there's there's contact there. There's 100% contact there. I would say it's slight contact. Very slight contact. But there's contact there. Ure feels it. And the Union attacker, on a bit of a delayed reaction, tries to sell it and sells the contact and goes down at the edge of the box. Referee points to the spot. It's a penalty kick. Philadelphia scores in the 26th minute. They're up 1-0. What are your thoughts on the penalty kick? Because again, Inter Miami post game, they didn't make a big deal about it, but they were clearly not pleased with that call. It was a penalty, wasn't it? It was a penalty. His leg, he just stuck his leg out. I think it was definitely a penalty. I so in the press box, I, you know, I had you to my left, I had Michelle Kaufman of the Miami Herald, our good friend, to my right. And you know, she she was saying like, "Oh, that's that's a poor way for the Union to have to take the lead. Because up until then, the Union hadn't created all that much uh, either. They created a couple looks, but not not all that much. And I told her, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's soft. 100% it's soft. And I stick with that today, a day later. It was a soft call. But by the letter of the law, Amema Bika did make contact. And this is a contact sport, so I get the argument for why it shouldn't be a penalty kick. But by the letter of the law... He had his leg stuck out there. He does impede Ure a little bit. Obviously, Ure sells it and embellishes it to try to to try to win the call, and he gets it. So soft, yes. I think it's a penalty kick. I think it's a penalty kick. If a Mabika, I think it's it's not a malicious challenge, obviously, because he's not he's not looking to foul him. But I think it's a bit clumsy from Mabika. If Mabika stays, keeps his feet, then we're not talking about the referee having to make a decision. By sticking out his leg, and then on top of that, Ure is selling it, now you've left yourself exposed for the referee to make a decision. And De Oliveira makes a decision to point to the spot. That's how the Philadelphia Union go ahead. I do think it's a penalty kick. 
as soft a penalty kick as you as you could as you might see. And I would 100% hear the argument for why it's not a penalty kick. Part of me would even agree or, or like be like, you know what? You're not wrong. I don't I like it, it's just up to the ref's criteria. And on this one, he pointed to the spot. Bad bad luck for Inter Miami, but you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. You know, against Minnesota United, we talked about it. I don't recall if Primo, if you were on the pod, but after the Minnesota United game, Andrea and I had agreed that we thought Campana got away with like a little push on a, on a Minnesota United player on the lead up to Indiana Vasilev's game winner. And that one, that didn't go, that, that went uncalled. Inter Miami won that game. So sometimes you get, good, sometimes the calls go your way, sometimes they do not. They did not go Inter Miami's in, in this situation and they fell behind. Now, Phil Neville clearly was, you know, again, they didn't make a big fuss about it post game, but you could tell, you could tell that that they they did not like that call. And a quote, Phil Neville, this is from the the piece on Miami Total Football that and it's from Phil Neville's post game press conference last night. But he says, "quote Maybe we could have had a penalty, but we were never going to get anything from this referee. I did not actually think the one that was called against Inter Miami was a penalty. Did anyone else think it was a penalty? No." No, uh, end quote. So that's that's that was those were Phil Neville's thoughts. He, he obviously goes from talking about a play that involved Bryce Duke, that Inter Miami, you know, asked for a penalty kick but didn't get one, and then he 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 surveyed the room in terms of the penalty kick that was called against Inter Miami against the Mayma Bika. DeAndre Yedlin after the game says, "quote I thought there were some interesting calls, but that is how it is, I guess." End quote. I spoke to a Mayma Bika one on one, one on one. And I was able to ask him about that penalty kick call. This is what Amey Mabika said. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely need to, to watch it. Um, whether it was enough to, to be deemed a penalty, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not yeah. too sure about that. But, I mean, it was called and uh, went down the goal. So, obviously, di- disappointed in myself for that. But uh, we'll just have to move on. Is there, is there something as a center back you can do there? Is there something different you can do? I mean, because, again, it's not like you completely took him out. There's contact, and then he he obviously goes down to sell it. Is there anything you can do to the center back differently, or is that just, that's just I mean, the play? Yeah, I mean, it happens, and it happens quickly um, without being, you know, a Monday, Monday morning but, quarterback, sure. you know, in hindsight, maybe maybe just try not to make any contact at all, but like you said, it happened, and right. try to put it try to put it behind me, and try to put it, the team try to put it uh, this game behind us and move on to Charlotte, because that'll come quickly. You can, you can read between the lines. They don't agree with that call. Yeah. They don't agree with that call. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it was a bad, it's a bad, it's a bad, uh, I won't say it's a bad decision. It's a, an unfortunate moment for the team, but it's, it is what it is. And, you know, they still had ch- time to come back from it. And they just couldn't because the attack continued to sputter. You know, after the game, Phil Neville said, I think this team is crying out for goals. And I think that's, that's an, accurate description for the team because they're, they're, they're hurting in a big way in the attack. The defense eventually will have issues, will break down. You can't just rely on the defense to to always post clean sheets and get you get you a, a shutout. You, you, you've got to score goals. You've got to score goals. And that, that helps take some pressure off the defense as well. So, look, Amema Bika in this one, penalty kick aside, didn't have a great game. Something that you noted before, he was pulled at halftime for Ryan Saylor, who I thought was much better in the second half. Those two center backs have been alternating as of late. I think right now, Ryan Saylor is in the better run of form. And that's not because of last night. I just think Ryan Saylor has been uh, has been performing a little bit better than Amey Mabika in the recent appearances I've seen. I'm not too sure why Phil Neville continues to rotate them or have them on this merry-go-round there at, at the left center back spot. But... I think I think Amey Mabika is unlikely to to see the field ahead of Ryan Saylor for the foreseeable future after after last night's game because to get pulled at halftime is a pretty is a pretty big sign that you didn't perform and it's a pretty big sign because I asked him I asked Mabika hey are you healthy is everything okay and he said yeah yeah I'm healthy so he was pulled we're assuming for tactical reasons not because it was you know planned beforehand or anything like that it, it, it it's Probably a safe assumption that it was a tactical decision from Phil Neville and probably because he wasn't happy with what he was seeing from Amima Bika. Actually, I remember one play from you, Primo, that you were like, oh, Damian Lowe is slow. And I was like, Damian Lowe is not slow. And you were referring to a play, actually, 
where it was Mabika that was that was struggling to catch up to to the Philadelphia Union attacker. So uh, yeah. yeah, not not a great not a great half from Ame Mabika. I'm not sure why Phil Neville continues to rotate. I, I don't know if you if you have any idea or you know you have any thoughts on why he might be rotating the two, but. I, yeah, I think Ryan Saylor is is slightly ahead right now, and I think he should be getting more of the looks in the in the upcoming stretch of games. Yeah, no, Mabika and Low were all over the place last night. Mabika's normally pretty sort of consistent, isn't he? He's quite solid, but no, he had a bit of a nightmare last night. And Low was just yeah, again they kept losing the ball all the time and giving it away, and just um, yeah, it was a quite a bitty game, wasn't it? There was a few tackles going in, and it was it was getting quite physical out there, but. No, they they um they couldn't withstand it, unfortunately. Inter Miami finished with twelve shots, three on target. Philadelphia had eleven, five shots on target. Fifty eight percent possession for Inter Miami, forty two for the Union. Again, the Union don't prize themselves on possession. They just care about being effective, about high pressing, and and they did they did that. They did that. Now, before we finish up this segment. We have to talk about this weekend's game against Charlotte FC. Right now, Charlotte is in seventh place in the Eastern Conference. So they're in the final playoff spot. They have a four-point advantage over Inter Miami. They've played one more game, but they have a four-point advantage right now. This is a big game for the South Florida side. There's still a lot of games to be played. 15, if I'm not mistaken. But this is a pretty big one because you can't let that gap continue to grow because then you're going to put your back against the wall going into the final couple months of the year. So this is a game at home against an Eastern Conference opponent that is vying for a playoff spot, a direct competitor for those playoff spots. You have to win this game. You have to win this game if you're Inter Miami. So for you, Primo, Charlotte, not bad for an expansion side being in seventh place. They've even gone a co- undergone a, a coaching change. They have an 8-win, 10-loss, and 2-draw record, so they don't tie a whole lot. They either just win or lose. What does Inter Miami have to do to beat the expansion side, which has scored 23 goals but also given up 24? Just talking about expansion sides, Austin as well, top top of the Western Conference on 40 points. You know, twelve games only lost only lost four. It's amazing. Anyway, um, I digress. Yeah, for 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 their second season in MLS to go from where they were last awesome. year to to go to where they are now. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 another example. And I you know I don't want to kick Inter Miami while they're down, and I don't want you know I don't want to pile well, on here. That was them, yeah. Right, like like, that, like you know what? It's difficult for an expansion team to be successful. But if you put the building blocks in place in year one, then year two, you know, you could have a very competitive team, Nashville. Austin, LAFC, when you know Atlanta, Atlanta won the cup in their second season, so it's it, it was possible. It was yeah, possible. They made mistakes, right, but the they mistakes made a lot they of mistakes. The first, they made a lot of mistakes. The first couple yeah. of seasons yeah. have, have done them for that, but right. they're, they're still trying to move on from that. They're still dealing with Pellegrini's contract. They just got rid of Carranza, though. That's one 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 less piece that they have to worry about. But they still have, you know, pieces that are still uh, hanging on from that original disastrous first regime but anyway this weekend's game charlotte fc what does inter miami have to do do not tell me they have to score goals that's obvious how how do they go about winning this game primo but by just being being better yeah what, <laughs> <laughs> that is it very very simple game this is why this is why they, is why they pay you the big bucks man this is why they pay you the big it's bucks it. it's a very simple game they just have to be they have to be they have to be better what 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 was Phil Neville saying about Pozuelo last night? Same 50 50 chance, 50 50 chance. That's the, you know, that's, that's as of what we know from Wednesday night, that's, you know, that's where he stands. Now, we will have availability with Phil Neville on Friday. Maybe we'll get an update then as to Pozuelo's status for the weekend. But we wanted to get this podcast out before Friday because it's such a quick turnaround. So, as of right now, the latest thing that we know is that it's 50 50. Let's say he doesn't play. Let's say he doesn't play. Let's yeah. say it's, a, it's more or less the same group. Again, they have to play better. How do they, have they play to retain better? possession? Well, they have to keep the ball better. You know, they 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 were trying to attack, like you say, they're mostly down the right. But you said about Yedlin and, and Taylor, they're the two probably two of the most talented players. So it's it's un, not unsurprising they've got a good relationship together. But they've just got to try and keep the ball better and just try and create stuff. Bring Campania into the game more. Maybe he'll have to drop a little bit deeper. 
Um, you know, it's just they have to try and mix it up because whatever they were trying on against Philadelphia wasn't wasn't working. So I will say, and I just said that Sailor should be ahead of Mabika in terms yeah. of, in ter- but, yeah, I've definitely but off the back uh, of that performance, yeah. But if if because I'm going off of what I think Philadelphia will do, but if Inter Miami wants to try to get more from its attack. If you want to keep, if you want to bring Christopher McVeigh, tuck him in, put him back in his natural center back position next to Low, okay. Get Kieran Gibbs back out there, or Jovan Jones. Give yourself a more natural left back option out there to help whichever left winger is starting. I don't think Emerson Rodriguez gets another start. I don't think he did enough to to warrant that. And Phil Neville didn't directly talk about Emerson Rodriguez when when he said this following point but he did say in order to get on the field you have to produce he was talking just generally speaking here he wasn't talking about emerson rodriguez to be clear he said you have to produce that's how you get you know into the coach's thoughts that's how you get into the team more consistently and i don't think emerson did that so i don't think emerson starts again i think vasilev comes back in not sure on the status of last year yet i i, I you know he, he didn't dress for wednesday so i think it's it's a long shot that he plays on saturday so I think you'll see probably Taylor and Vasilev on the wings. But again, you need more in the attack. You need more in the attack. So start. I think Kieran Gibbs or Jovan Jones, one of them, I would say, has to start. Now, does Phil Neville do that? We'll see. Because it's very likely he could just stick with Christopher McVeigh and put Ryan Saylor at center back next to Damian Lowe. But if it's me, I'm, I'm starting to think about getting a natural fullback out there to help the attack, to help the attack, because... Well, Gibbs is fit now, from what I understand. Right, Gibbs is, right. Gibbs he's, is he, fit, he, so he's good to go. So um, that could that could give him an option on, on Saturday. Right, so you need to start... I, I Again, I, I can't make this any more clear. You, as Inter-Miami, in my opinion, need to start taking more risks. And that comes with the possibility of giving up goals. Yes. But you're not going to win games if you can't score goals. And right now, Inter Miami is not scoring goals. So give yourselves a better chance and open yourself up a little bit. Push more numbers forward. Get more attack minded players on that field and live with the results. Live with the results. If that doesn't work out, then okay. Then, you know, this team is flawed. Uh, you know, the shortcomings here, here, and here with the roster, here with the coaching staff, whatever it is. But give yourselves a chance. You know, Phil Neville earlier in the year talked about, he's talked about during his tenure about being bold, being brave, going after it. Okay, go after it. Here's your chance. Whether Pozuelo's there or not, obviously that changes the dynamic. If he's not there, we're going with the assumption he's not there. You still should be bold. You You should still be brave and go after it. Because playing this this style that we've seen by and large for the last few games... And for much of much of Phil was tenure, it's just not very attractive. So not only are you not winning consistently, it's all you're also not doing so, or you're doing so in a pretty ugly manner. So anyway, all right, primo. Before we close out the segment, touch on one more thing very very quickly, and that's that Barcelona. There is a Barcelona friendly on the schedule for next Tuesday. There's also an open training that was announced. For Monday, but you need tickets for that. You need tickets for that for Barcelona's open training session on Monday night at Drive Pink Stadium. I don't know if we will do a pod be- before the Barcelona game and after the Charlotte game. That the, the turnaround's even tighter because there's only uh, two days in between those games, and it's a friendly. Yes, it's Barcelona, but it's a friendly. So I don't know if we will do one. Maybe it's possible. I won't rule it out. But I don't, I, I don't know. I would say, like Pozuelo, it's 50-50. But anyway, if we don't, we will come back next week and we'll recap the Charlotte game and the Barcelona match. Really quickly, Primo, just in case we don't come back and, and preview that game more specifically, what do you think... I mean, it's a sold-out game, but what do you think we'll, we'll see on the field in terms of Inter-Miami versus Barcelona? I don't know. I was just thinking now. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean look, by Barcelona are in the... Everyone's in the preseason mode now, aren't they? So all the clubs in Europe, Chelsea are in, in, in the US as well. I'm going to cover their, their match against Arsenal in Orlando next weekend. Um, so I think it will be be quite competitive. And I guess at least the result won't matter too much for Inter Miami, but at least they can, they can maybe try some stuff out against top, top level of, you know, opposition. 
Um, so it could be quite handy for them, really, as a, as a, as a training exercise for sure to come up against, you know, um, Barcelona just signed Rafinha from Leeds for like $55 million, I think, or no, more than that, $65 million. So there's going to be some quality players there. Aubameyang as well. There was Arsenal, um, Frank de Jong, who's potentially going to go to Man United. I mean, yeah, you know, there's a lot of top, top quality players. So it'd be a good experience for, for some of the Inter Miami guys. Maybe some of the young kids as well will get a chance. I think, I think again, I said this, you know, when the game was announced. I think it's, you know, you're going to see some starters play for 20, 30 minutes. And then it's going to be a rotation. You're going to see yeah. Inter Miami 2 players like Harvey Neville, Romeo Beckham. You're going to see them play against, at some point as well, Barcelona's second team players. because But they're in preseason. It's, up. it's all set up for Romeo Beckham, isn't it? <laughs> His dad played for Real Madrid and now he's ready to shoot down Barcelona. It's going to happen. <laughs> or we dreamed of. It's off, not off a free kick. Off of a yeah, free off, kick. Just like, he scored a yeah. great... If anyone's seen it, he scored a great free kick the other day, didn't he? Quality. Yeah. And the one tweet actually had one of David Beckham's goals. I think it was for England. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. Exactly the same sort of technique. Exactly the same result. But uh, yeah, no, it was, that was that's it. It's all set up, mate. It's poetic. It's poetic. But, you know... Have fun if you're going out there. This is what I would say if you're going. Are you going, Primo? Are you are you attending that one? Yes, I'll be there. I'll be yeah. covering it. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's in, yeah, it's good, big interest. It's Barcelona, so it's always you know there's some big names there, and big you know it's like always a, always a good story. Yeah, and, and 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 for you Barcelona fans, lovers, listeners that are out there, or just soccer, football aficionados in general, Barcelona arrives to town from what I've been told on Saturday. I don't know what time. I don't know which airport, but they arrive on Saturday. So as of Saturday, you will probably see them in and around South Florida. So that means Sunday, you could potentially find them to go take pictures with them if you know if that's what your thing to do is. So just just keep an eye on on that, and of course on their social media channels. This is the other thing I'll say, and we'll close out the segment. If you're planning to go to Tuesday's game, you have tickets. Or if you don't have tickets and you're planning to get tickets, get there early. This game is sold out. Drive Pink Stadium has enough problems as it is with traffic and getting in and out when it's close to kickoff on a half-filled stadium for Inter Miami. So for this game, it's going to be, uh, I can imagine, wild, wild. You know, we've been, we've been told that there's been, you know, 200, I think, 200 plus. Uh, media credential requests, which is by far and away as big as or bigger than anything Inter Miami has gotten to this point. So that's just from a media standpoint. This again, tickets that was announced this week, they're sold out, sold out. So get there early because if you run late, if you're gonna cut it close, you're going to be at risk of missing. A good part, if not the entire first half, between the traffic that is sure to happen on the streets on Commercial Boulevard, in the parking area, as well as the foot traffic to actually just get into the stadium. I know, listen, I'm I'm a South Floridian. I know being late is just part of our DNA and our culture here. But I would say fight that as much as you can on Tuesday. Get there early. Better early than late. Better there in your seat before kickoff. And as opposed to, you know, missing half of the game, especially with the price that these tickets are at. So if you're going, enjoy it. But I recommend highly, and can't stress enough, get there early. Okay, Primo, that does it for this segment. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back for the Q&A session and our final thoughts after this. Okay, Primo, Q&A time. Let's just do a couple to keep it nice and short because, again, short turnaround before the next game on Saturday night at 8 p.m. against Charlotte FC for Inter Miami. This comes from Spontaneous Phil. And no, it's not Phil Neville. It's just a Twitter user with the name of Spontaneous Phil. I thought Gonzalo had his best game of the season even without the goal. He worked very hard the time he was in, and I'm happy to see that. Do you expect Corentin John 
to be an immediate starter or an impact sub. I keep hearing he's going to be in before Pozuelo. Also, couldn't fit this all in one reply. My other question is, with Carranza being signed permanently with 500000 in general allocation money to the Philadelphia Union, do you expect another big signing this summer transfer window or no? Okay, so Primo, you want to go first or you want me to go first? No, yeah, any more signings coming in? I was always told two, two were going to come in and that's that's happened, so... I don't know. Do, do, what do you think? I think what that's it. Think? No, I think that's it. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think they round out the roster with these two additions. Again, can't forget Inter Miami is a bit, a bit hamstrung in terms of their salary budget because of the sanctions. Yes, they got five hundred thousand dollars in general allocation money as part of the, the buy or the transfer of Carranza to the Philadelphia Union. But that five hundred thousand is split between twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. So Inter Miami got nothing for him this year. So doesn't help them in terms of this year's budget uh, situation. As for uh, for Corentin John, do I expect him to be an immediate starter or an impact sub? I think they're looking at him to be a starter. I think they're looking to, to have him come in and, and try to make an impact and be the type of more lethal and dangerous and creative winger than they've had consistently this year. Whether that's realistic, whether that's a realistic expectation for someone that will be coming in off of, off an off season that's adapting not only on the field to a different league and a different style and new teammates and tactics, but also off the field. Because as Gonzalo Higuain says, to borrow his phrase, these are players, not robots. So they also have to take care of stuff off the field and situate themselves. Whether they're, you know, they're gonna going to live in a house, an apartment. Normally, they get set up initially in a hotel, so they're living out of a suitcase in a hotel. But obviously, there's a lot of logistical things that they have to map out and figure out, and that obviously takes some of your attention away from the full task at hand of being able to fully concentrate just on your football, just on your soccer, just on your day to day. So I think they're looking at him to be an immediate starter. I am sure he'll get starts if and when that visa comes through. But can we really expect him to be an every game starter? I think it's I think it's a tough ask. I think it's a tough ask. Not impossible. It's not impossible. Maybe he comes in and he scores goals and you know he makes an immediate impact, but I think it's a it's a tough ask. Okay. Let's do one more. And it comes from Roger Ojeda. And this one is more directed at me, primo, because he says in Spanish, se nos va Gareca. And there's two sad face emojis or defeated sad face emojis. And what that means in English is that Gareca is leaving us. And that's because Today, the news out of Peru is that Ricardo Gareca, Peru's head coach for the last seven years, he is not renewing his contract with Peru. That you know he he had been offered a deal to stay on for four more years, wasn't to his liking. They tried to renegotiate it, still wasn't to his liking. There's there's reports about what he did not like. Apparently, there was a forty percent reduction in his in his wages. What do people what do, what do people in Peru say? Are they are they upset about it or not? So, I think listen. I think you know, especially in a country where where football is king, you know, you get all types of opinions. And I think that I I would say that the va- I would I won't say the vast majority. I would say the majority. And I don't know what the numbers are, but I would say that the majority are a bit sad and appreciative of his tenure with Peru because Peru did things with a team that on paper isn't very good on paper and in South America which is very very competitive they achieved very good things with him at the helm they had their rough moments they had their their valleys as as you know as a team like Peru will but they also had very high peaks and that's you know they they got third place at the 2015 Copa America his first international tournament with Peru then in 2018, they qualified for the World Cup. First time in 36 years they qualified for the World Cup. In 2019, after a poor start to the Copa America, they made their first final in... I can't remember how many years I'm blanking right now, but they made their first final in, in multiple decades at the Copa America, which they lost to Brazil in Brazil. And then they got fourth place at the 2021 Copa America before just now, here this year, 
falling one game shy of reaching a second consecutive World Cup, losing on penalty kicks to Australia. So he made them competitive. He brought excitement back to to Peruvian national team fans. And that and that's obviously not something to be taken for granted, especially after a long, long time of struggles. So I personally, me, personally me, and you know, the day that that uh that Southgate leaves England, I'll I'll ask you the same. Personally me it's it's one sad and I think two it's it's bad thing that he's leaving because he he has taken a team that again is not you know that is greater than the sum of its parts and 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 that is difficult to do and that's you know that's that's something here at Inter Miami for example the team's not necessarily great on paper but a good coach a very good coach can squeeze more lime out of that or squeeze more excuse me squeeze more juice out of that lime or out of that lemon and I don't think that that's the case with Inter Miami but with Peru and yes I am of Peruvian descent but I think again take take me out of it just look at the results and look at the players they have they don't have players playing at the highest levels in Europe and yet they've still been very competitive and I think that's a testament yes to the players and the performances but also to the job that Gareca and his coaching staff have done so it will be a new era for Peru. Gareca supposedly will have a press conference. He's going to return to Peru to have a press conference on his own. It's not the Federation doing it. It's his own. Uh, just to answer questions before he leaves the, the country where he's become kind of like a, a folklore hero. So, you know, as a Peruvian national team fan, as a Peruvian uh, myself, I would say thank you to Gareca. I actually got a chance to work with him at the 2016 Copa America. I was behind the scenes with Peru's national team when they played here in the states i traveled with them was on the bus with them ate with them it was probably one of my best uh experiences in, in my career and I, I didn't do it as a journalist there i was working you know social media for um for them for the tournament so uh you know good memories uh unforgettable seven years but as we know life goes on we'll see what the next chapter of peru brings but that does it for that question and the q a session i got kind of poetic there huh phil uh, neville, <laughs> phil neville new peru manager it could happen <laughs> maybe may, maybe if phil neville leaves this winter maybe they'll bring in gareca because they'll be like wow gareca can actually you know he can really squeeze all the juice out yeah. of that lemon uh um, phil's peru that'd be hey, it. That's, that's it gareca made a pretty penny in peru but hey got you know if he won in dollars that might not that might be seductive for him but although i know he I, I believe he said he wants to stay close to argentina and be close to home because he's getting uh up there in years okay primo final thoughts share yours i'll share mine and then we'll close out the pod after that yeah i was just thinking actually Normally, I don't get too excited about sort of friendlies. Certainly, I've covered so many friendlies, you know, preseason friendlies, and they just they ended up just being a bit meaningless, really. But you know, other than just to, for players to get themselves in, into into shape. But um, you know, the Barcelona game I think will be interesting. It's, it's gonna that would be you know we're going to see some top class players playing, which is great. And then uh, yeah, Chelsea. For 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but we're still we're still going to see Barcelona players, aren't we? So it will still be a, you know a top level opponent for them. So I think that's a good is a good training exercise. I'm actually yeah, should be quite lively, shouldn't it? Loads of the press room be absolutely packed. Um, some decent names there, yeah. No, it should be interesting. Alejandro Pozuelo was introduced at halftime of the of Inter Miami's game on Wednesday. And Jorge and Jose Mas were alongside him, as was uh, Chris Henderson. But I don't know how many people actually realized that that was happening. Because... No, and they were losing at the time, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a kind of, it would have been it, better if yeah. they'd been winning and he could bring him onto the pitch when we go crazy, but, you know, they were sort of stinking the place out a bit. And then it was like, <laughs> oh, here, here's Pozuelo. <laughs> don't worry, it's all going to be okay. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, Primo is the most critical he's been. Look at that. This, this is the new and improved Primo. Well, maybe not improved. This is, I guess it just depends on your on your vantage point. By the way, I have to ask you. That, that's just my final thought. I just didn't, you know, the way they presented him, it just kind of seemed like a, like a second thought. It wasn't like a, a yeah, well, it, it wasn't well, made it to be the, a big the deal. The circumstances were great, were they? So... It was a bit. It was yeah, a bit. Like what, it was a bit flat. It was a bit flat. And I'm sure that there's scheduling and all the stuff that goes into it. But it would have been better to have him before a game and present him before a game, where you know more of the focus could be on him at halftime. Sure. You know, people are going to to the concessions. People are going to the bathroom. It, like I don't. It just. 
I I wasn't huge on the on the way they it, they formally introduced him to to inter Miami fans. Which by the way, we still haven't had a chance to talk to him either. I imagine that will be soon. Maybe as soon as Friday. Maybe maybe, but uh, hopefully soon because yeah, we still haven't had a chance to speak to him about his arrival to South Florida. Now, primo, before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you one thing. Because we cannot do an old school style podcast of just you and I without asking you how your football manager is going. So please enlighten us, share with us, tell us you've won a cup at no, long last. I'm still, I've had a little hiatus for the last week or so, but I'm still at Dortmund. I think four, se- <laughs> four seasons in, ah, haven't right, won anything longevity, yet. Longevity. Won the Super Cup, second to Bayern the whole time. Bayern just beat me as well. I think I lost the league by about 20 points one year, so... No, but I'm sticking with it because I just think we're on the verge of something. We're close. We're close. Um, you know, there's some good young players coming through. Made some good sign. I've signed Antoine Griezmann. He's 33, but you know, just provides something a bit different. You know, um, so and the board are sticking with me, and I've still got to support the fans. So, you know, I just haven't won anything. Well, but I've been competitive. That's... And I had to. And Haaland went to Bayern Munich for free because I didn't. <laughs> Because <laughs> he didn't renew his contracts, so that was te- that wasn't good. Oh, uh, and you were raving about him, so that must have hurt. That he was my hurt. guy, yeah. yeah, yeah, he was my guy. But... Oh, see, so you're just like not winning titles, but you're just staying along. For- Don't you think it's time you step down? You go take on a new event. Why, why keep putting Borussia Dortmund fans through the ring of mediocrity <laughs> after four seasons? Don't you think it's time to give somebody else a chance and you go on to some we're other? We're close. Team? We're close. If we just stop losing to Bayern and let's stop losing about four or five other different games, then we'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. but no, no, there's some good young players. It's a good young team. You can just keep trying for years and years. So, like, Makuku's only 19. Well, he's like my star striker now. Well, like, what, how good qu- will he be when he's 25, 26? Last question. Last question for you on this. If you don't win something in the next season, will, will you step down? Will you, like, move on and just try no. to... Really? You no, just I'll keep, keep going? going. I'm going to keep going until I win something for sure, yeah. What if you never win something? What if you keep no, banging your head again? I'm close, mate. I'm close. I'm close. It's just, you just, you know, maybe I should have been more positive in certain things when playing Bayern. Yeah, I went a bit negative and they did, they beat me. Oh. But then I was, <laughs> I was, I was already about seven points off anyway. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know. A but, bit uh, negative and not, not positive enough on the field. You see, we talked about that earlier on the pod. I can't recall exactly where, but yeah, we talked about that. Anyway, all right. That does it for this second edition of the pod. Thank you guys again so much for listening yet again. Actually, I almost, almost, almost forgot. We have a winner for the lottery. And no, I do not know this person because, you know, there's always, there's always somebody that will be like, ah, no, this is rigged. This is that. No, there, I don't know this person. But this person did win the second, you know, we, we gave one jersey to, to Jeffrey Poole just because I liked his message. I didn't put him in the lottery. I actually talked to him a bit yesterday before the game. We met up and and we were able to catch up and talk some football. I still haven't given him his jersey, but it is coming. I'm just waiting for him to give me the details of his address and which size and which one that he wants. Now, the winner, the winner of the lottery is Federico Vargas. Federico Vargas. And again, I do not know Federico. I've never met Federico in my life. I actually haven't even talked to Federico until he sent the message. So unlike Jeffrey, because Jeffrey, I had exchanged just different DMs with talking about Inter Miami beforehand, as I do with a lot of you that just have questions or that have just thoughts on the team. I had talked to Jeffrey Poole in the past. I've never spoken to Federico Vargas beforehand. So he has won one. Make sure you DM me to give me your address as well as your size and which jersey of the initial year you want. But again, we can sort that out over DMs. But again, that does it for this week's show. We will be back again probably next week after Barcelona, unlikely beforehand, although I won't rule it out. So for Steve El Primo Brenner, I am Franco Pinizo. You have been listening to Miami Total Football.